Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our next session. And we're going to, this session will be on Goodyear Nicastro, a transnational and comparative perspective. And Professor Linda Silverman from New York University School of Law will be our principal presenter. Um, also on the panel, Jonathan Blackman will join us again. Um, Dean Carrington will join us. And Professor uh, Leah Brillmeyer from Yale University will join us. And John Vale and Dean Perdue. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Professor Silverman. Um, thank you very much. And like all the panelists, let me extend my thanks to um, the Law Review, to the University of South Carolina, and to Howard, who deserves enormous credit for putting together a panel um, before the decisions uh, had even come down. As I said to him, you know, this was a very risky venture. It could have been a real flop, um, depending what the Supreme Court did. And as you see, um, there are uh, a number of uh, different uh, issues. And um, I'm going to approach this um, in a somewhat different way. Um, it's called a transnational and comparative uh, perspective, and we've identified this uh, panel as an international uh, panel. I really just want to take um, a couple of perspectives on looking at this case. Uh, maybe Professor Miller will be happy because I won't necessarily talk about Goodyear and Castro per se, but he, on the other hand, and um, there are several of us here who are, um, I guess, the disciples uh, of Professor, Professor Miller, and we uh, owe him uh, a great deal um, in terms of uh, the development of our careers. Um, I'm not so sure how happy he'll be uh, when he, he sees what's happened uh, to some of his disciples. But in any event, um, let me talk about um, two aspects of um, jurisdiction in the international and the comparative context. Um, I'm going to do that by talking first about the prospect of a separate jurisdictional analysis for transnational cases. And secondly, um, I'm going to talk a little bit comparatively about how other countries deal um, with jurisdiction. I'm not sure I have any recipe. We are in the United States, um, the tradition of due process and the constitutional test is firmly ingrained. So um, whatever changes there are, I doubt uh, that is going to change. One is going to have to um, try to do whatever fix one likes within the context of uh, that very long-standing uh, tradition. But um, Goodyear and Nicastro are transnational cases and not interstate cases. And although there's little said in either opinion that uh, indicates the justices think there should be any difference of treatment, Certainly, the Supreme Court's earlier decision in Asahi with its reasonableness test uh, certainly could be read um, as just such an indication. Um, there's uh, also in a transnational case the question, and we have talked about this, what the focus of the contacts could be, should be. And Justice uh, Ginsburg in the Castro certainly thinks that the contacts with the United States as a whole should be relevant in determining whether a foreign defendant that has a national, uh, a nationwide distribution has engaged in purposeful conduct with a particular state. You might not have to do that in an interstate case, but in an international or transnational case, it seems to me that that is a very stronger uh, argument. And on a different approach to that uh, issue, um, contacts. Um, with the United States is not the focus of existing law. As we have discussed in the earlier panels, uh, congressional action could move the minimum contacts inquiry um, from that of contacts with a particular state to contacts with the United States as a whole. So those are just some ways about how a separate transnational analysis might work, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute. Um, I also want you to think about Goodyear and Nicastro from a comparative perspective. That is, how have other countries decided jurisdiction in what I would characterize as the mirror transnational case? That is, just flip the facts and think about it this way. And what does that tell us about the values 
that are encompassed in a jurisdictional regime. In the Castro, you recall, Justice Ginsburg's dissent calls attention to the EU regulation, um, arguing that United States plaintiffs are at a disadvantage in comparison to plaintiffs elsewhere in the world. Now, the burdens on defendants in defending in the United States, as opposed to defending elsewhere, such as exposure to juries, to class actions, to discovery, all the things that um, Professor Miller talked about the other day as wonderful attributes of the U.S. system are not necessarily viewed that way uh, abroad. And they may be uh, more significant than Justice Ginsburg credits when she decides to compare uh, the relative advantages and disadvantages of suing in particular fora. But she is certainly correct that the place of injury um, is a well-accepted jurisdictional basis in other countries. And you know, the issue of the Airbus coming over and hitting South Carolina, the Europeans would have no difficulty with the injury in the United States as the basis of jurisdiction. So I want to... Uh, to take up both of those points, and the first one is whether there should be a different standard for transnational cases. And um, although the constitutional test for jurisdiction of international shoe, and we've repeated this over again, but I want to do it once more, that a defendant have certain minimum contexts such that the maintenance of the suit does not offend traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice, what I call the balance uh, test, was not a bright line rule. And, but the subsequent enactment of the state-specific act statutes after international shoe and the guidance that we did get from the Supreme Court, I think gave us some measure of predictability. You heard me before on this point about predictability, and it is a value um, that I think is important. Um, the sea change comes in uh, Asahi, uh, where the court uh, now brings in this element of reasonableness. And I think, again, uh, the eight justices that subscribe to the reasonableness uh, prong, or the unreasonable prong of uh, Asahi, however you want to see it, um, Justice Scalia does not join, and that maybe that gives us some hint of where uh, the court was going. But because Asai was a case involving a foreign defendant, one might have concluded that the court had added that prong, that is the issue of reasonableness, as an element, if you will, of comedy when jurisdiction was being asserted over a foreign country defendant. And those were, of course, the facts uh, in Asahi. And you may recall the court actually uh, talks about, in the reasonableness piece of the opinion, the unique burdens placed upon one who must defend oneself in a foreign legal system and that those, that should be given significant weight. So there's a concern about the foreign defendant, or at least arguably there's that concern. Of course, the post-Asahi cases... Um, if you look at them, they bring in reasonableness in domestic cases as well as the transnational cases, although my own read of those cases suggests that uh, when the court actually finds unreasonableness, um, those are often the foreign uh, defendant cases. But to get that principle is very hard. I mean, after all, they decide helicopteros, and they don't say a word about uh, reasonableness, and... Um, one reason might be that they decide they're not sufficient activity for systematic and continuous activity, so they don't have to get there. And in fairness, um, it may be the same reason they don't get there in Goodyear uh, or Nicastro, because at least the plurality says there's not sufficient context and they have no uh, reason to proceed uh, further. But if, as others have read those cases, uh, it signals the court's retreat from this two-step analysis, first contacts, and then reasonableness. They'll get no quarrel uh, uh, from me. I think uh, reasonableness is an indeterminate standard for a constitutional test. We're not now talking just about sort of discretion. 
And um, I do think that some of the burden questions that might come up can be taken care of by a nuanced doctrine of uh, forum nonconvenience. And in this sense, I disagree with um, my co-author, uh, Alan Stein, because I think forum nonconvenience, although not perfect, uh, can do um, a great deal uh, of the work. Now, why a separate test for the transnational case? Um, whatever you use, whatever vehicle you use, there are special concerns that may warrant attention to the foreign status of the defendant, although these concerns can point in different directions. So on the one hand, there is concern for the plaintiff. Um, if he cannot sue the foreign defendant in the United States, he may not be able to sue at all. The burdens of travel, distance, costs, as well as access to a lawyer abroad may make litigation abroad impractical or impossible. At the same time, on the other side, a foreign defendant who sued in the United States also faces burdens of cost and distance, particularly since the U.S. system is one of the few that requires a defendant to pay its own legal fees, um, even if ultimately successful. And it seems to me it's, it helps to understand other systems and is worth taking into account when designing jurisdictional rules for transnational cases, the impact of the unique procedures of any given legal system. Judicial systems vary in numerous ways, including rules about cost shifting or no, regimes of criminal and civil liability, such as the uh, action civil in some uh, civil law countries, rules on class actions, juries, and discovery, um, which are unique to the uh, American uh, system. And the, those differences may be particularly important, and I think Paul Carrington um, raised this uh, earlier today when he talked about the distinction between sort of general jurisdiction and specific jurisdiction and the concerns about the transnational case may cut in different directions in each of those cases because um, there are different concerns. Now, I um, want to take a look at Canada um, because Canada is maybe a system much closer to ours in the sense that um, they decide jurisdiction province by province and not nationally, and they do have a sort of constitutional uh, test in their jurisdictional uh, analysis. Um, and interestingly, um, the issue of whether there should be a different jurisdictional standard for transnational cases is presently before the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, these cases have been sitting there uh, for a while. Um, and uh, one of them actually, there are actually three. Two uh, involve uh, a uh, Canadian who is in Cuba at a resort and is injured there, comes back to uh, Ontario, and they try to take jurisdiction on Ontario. And the other one is an Internet case. So keep your eye on what's happening uh, in uh, Canada. But in an earlier uh, Ontario case, the uh, Ontario Supreme Court applied a jurisdictional rule in Ontario, and one that's uh, common in most Canadian provinces, where jurisdiction is based upon the damage to the plaintiff. That is, you can be injured somewhere else and come back to Ontario, and they will take jurisdiction on the basis of the damage. And interestingly, that provision was uh, held to be satisfied when the plaintiff uh, returned to Ontario after an accident in British Columbia, um, they took jurisdiction over the British Columbia defendant, but they uh, declined to exercise it against the defendants who were foreign and not Canadian. And the court said that as to the British Columbian defendant, the Canadian judicial structure was arranged such that there was no basis for concern about differential qualities or substantial burdens among provincial courts. So a treatment different for foreign uh, defendants. Um, there also seems to be a constitutional dimension in Canada, which requires a real and substantial connection as well as order and fairness. Well, that doesn't sound like a terribly black uh, letter uh, rule of jurisdiction either. And they uh, identify a number of factors that are to be taken into account, including whether the case is international uh, or interprovincial. And if you think our jurisdictional inquiries are complicated, 
Um, wait till you see theirs, because one of the inquiries you have to make is whether the court at the foreign defendant's home would exercise jurisdiction in similar circumstances. That is, what would the court do, the foreign court do in the mirror case, and would Canada then recognize that jurisdiction? And then a second inquiry relates to whether the judgment in Canada would be recognized in the country where enforcement of judgment against the foreign defendant might likely take place. So well, however complicated our jurisdictional inquiries are, um, theirs are much worse. And uh, it may be one of the reasons that they're about uh, to re-look uh, at uh, this issue. Nonetheless, the Canadian story is different um, from ours in a number of ways, um, and that is that in our jurisprudence, and this has been said time and time again, the emphasis, or at least the constitutional emphasis, is on the forum and the defendant, um, because it's that relationship that the court has always said is a matter of due process. So we already have a built-in concern for the defendant. We don't need any more, whereas in Canada, um, without that, there's a much a stronger reason to look harder at what's happening to the foreign uh, defendant. And also, in Ontario, as in many other provinces, they have a number of jurisdictional rules, and we'll see this when I talk a little bit more about the comparative side. Um, they will take jurisdiction whether uh, the plaintiff has suffered damage, or they'll assert jurisdiction over an out of uh, province or foreign defendant as a necessary party if one of the other parties is served in the province. And so, again, having jurisdiction over defendant two because you have jurisdiction over defendant one uh, is something that the United States would never permit because our inquiry is with respect to each defendant. That's the constitutional uh, test. But I thought it was interesting to see um, this approach uh, in Canada and to see how they end up dealing with the transnational cases since the United States Supreme Court seemed not to think very much at least about that. Um, another interesting point that emerges from the experience in Canada and although I don't think it should be part of the formal jurisdictional analysis the issue of recognition and enforcement of a potential judgment, and there was some discussion of this this morning, should certainly be a concern of the jurisdictional rules that are shaped, as well as, and I'm sure this is true, a practical concern to any lawyer uh, uh, bringing suit, whether in the United States uh, or abroad. I mean, in many cases, particularly those against large multinational corporations who have assets uh, everywhere, including the United States, recognition and enforcement will not be an issue. But a judgment in the United States in that case will be able to be enforced against assets that a defendant has. But in those cases where enforcement abroad will be necessary, a U.S. judgment against a foreign defendant may never be enforced. And this will be particularly true when U.S. jurisdiction is deemed to be exorbitant. Um, in general, I think the Europeans have broader rules than we do, but in the one area, which is general jurisdiction, it may be a reason to applaud the Supreme Court's decision in Goodyear, which has, wherever, whether you go as far as Allen does or you step back a little bit, it has certainly, I think, put limits on the ever-expanding concept of the doing business jurisdiction, and it's brought general jurisdiction more closely in line with that of other countries. As for recognition and enforcement of a U.S. judgment in a product liability case like Nicastro, the jurisdictional reach is not the concern. As we've seen, place of injury is a common basis of jurisdiction uh, almost everywhere else uh, without any concerns about a, a look at the defendant. Um, but enforcement of U.S. product liability judgments uh, has been an issue for other reasons, such as uh, rules of strict liability, jury verdicts, which they see as without reason, um, broad discovery, and so on and so forth. Now, looking ahead a bit, um, it seems to me, and I said something about this um, this morning, the Supreme Court's restrictive interpretation of uh, jurisdiction in the Castro may be the catalyst for federal legislation uh, to change that 
uh, result. Uh, the latest proposal uh, is the Foreign Manufacturers Legal Accountability uh, Act of uh, 2010, and that would require foreign manufacturers that want to distribute certain products to have registered agents uh, in the United States, specifically in a state with a substantial connection to the importation, distribution, or sale of the products. Um, uh, manufacturers uh, would not be permitted to sell certain products uh, in the United States unless they uh, registered uh, an agent for service and consented to the jurisdiction of the state in which the registered agent uh, is located. And um, the suggestion is that as a basis of consent, they would be subject to jurisdiction in both uh, state and um, federal court. As I said this morning, I think that the bill is aimed sort of the wrong way, um, and we talked about this, that is the injury is in New Jersey in a case like Nicastro, and why you would necessarily want registration there and suit in state A when the injury turns out to be in state B, even under this scheme, is not also uh, clear to me. I mean, I thought the earlier proposals that said nationwide contacts with venue in the place of injury made much more sense in terms of a scheme if one wanted to go the national contacts route. Now, um, I know um, Mr. Ferguson is not going to be happy with um, th this latest remark of mine, but Justice Ginsburg's dissent, I think, offers a variation on the concept of contacts with the United States as a whole. She would agree that in order to have national contacts, I really think she would understand that that would require action by, uh, by, uh, by Congress. Um, but even without the legislation, she offers what I would say is a common sense approach, referring back to the last panel, to specific jurisdiction. And she says, again, we've talked about this, if you enlist a U.S. distributor to develop a market throughout the United States, um, then they can certainly be said to avail themselves of one of the states in which the product is actually sold and uh, causes uh, injury. So... Um, I think she qualifies as common sense. I think that that would have been one way um, to arrive at um, a very good result. Indeed, I have to say, you know, when I, I never thought that this case was so far off the mark of Justice O'Connor's we need more. And I, I, when I look back, it does, she says, if you hire a distributor who operates as a sales agent. It is true, the language is sales agent in the state. But again, selling through a, a distributor for the United States, one would think, would uh, lead to uh, that uh, result. There are some other consequences um, that may flow from um, the decision in the Castro. Justice Ginsburg notes that foreign manufacturers who cause injury in other countries will be amenable to jurisdiction there. So U.S. manufacturers who sell products abroad would be subject to suit abroad at the place of injury. But if it turns out that you're going to have to enforce that judgment in the United States, there are going to be difficulties of enforcement here because that's, at least so far, the United States' view about recognition and enforcement one of the grounds for refusing to enforce if, it, if it's a basis of jurisdiction that, that is inconsistent with our own standards of jurisdiction. So one of the potential consequences is, yes, place of injury there, but if you need enforcement here, uh, there, may be, um, there may be difficulty. Okay, I'm going to now switch to try to talk a little bit about um, judicial jurisdiction uh, abroad and some of the... Um, uh, unique features here and some of the differences. Um, in the United States, as I've said several times now, it's the defendant and the forum and uh, that is the, um, in the, the focus. Um, other countries have very different values. In France, the interest of the state in providing a forum for its nationals uh, justifies the exercise of jurisdictional authority, although recently even they have had some uh, pushback. In other system, it's where the events occur, which explains a little bit the place uh, of injury. And you can find, and I handed out some materials just to give you a bit of an overview, um, I used the example of the European regulation. Um, and of course, it's a regional uh, 
instrument. And it's not a, a set of jurisdictional rules for all transnational cases. But I use it as an example because the rules there are, vi are often the same as rules of jurisdiction in na various national systems. So it's really not so different. Moreover, there is now an ongoing what they call a recast of that regulation, whereby the regulation is going to displace the national rules of judicial jurisdiction in all e EU countries as and as reformulated will apply to non-EU defendants, including U.S. defendants. So you want to look at those rules because assuming it goes through, and I'm told once the, once the commission starts, there's no stopping it, um, that um, those will now be the rules. And you won't have to look actually at the rules of England or France or anywhere else. You'll just have to look at this one set of, if you will, European rules for asserting jurisdiction by each of the countries that's a member uh, of the uh, EU. In general, the, EV, the view in the EU is that litigation should take place at home, uh, the home of the defendant, i.e. its domicile, or in a very limited number of uh, places, particular events which they identify. With respect to general jurisdiction or suit on any claim, um, it's the domicile of the um, defendant and the domicile of a corporation uh, is its uh, statutory seat, its, which is its place of incorporation, its central administration, or its principal place of business. And so as we've seen from before, it's substantially more limited than the U.S. concept of uh, doing business jurisdiction and much closer to the notion, as Alan talked about, of being sued at home, and I think it's this at home concept that's uh, picked up by Justice uh, Ginsburg. As for specific, uh, or as the EU knows, it's special jurisdiction. Um, the occurrence events in the forum, such as place of performance in a contract case, a tortious act in a tort case, um, effect of injury, or claims arising from the activities of a branch uh, if the claim arises uh, out of uh, uh, that branch. Now, one of the interesting things about the EU, and uh, this was raised by uh, Wendy uh, in the last uh, panel when she talked about the Coco case, um, there are specialized circumstances or concern for the little guy that lead to specialized rules for uh, maintenance creditors, that is, they, they can sue, uh, that is, the plaintiff can sue at home without regard to the defendant. Consumers can sue at home. Insureds can uh, sue at home in their own domicile, that is, the domicile of the plaintiff or sometimes its habitual uh, residence. Um, there's also a desire to have a single uh, litigation, and so in the multiple defendant case, they'll take jurisdiction over multiple defendants as long as they uh, have one if the claims are closely connected. So the overall effect is to have a limited number of fora uh, from which a plaintiff can choose. That minimizes uh, forum shopping. Um, they show other values, um, which I think are reflected generally in civil law jurisprudence. There are formal rules imposed. No overlay of discretion, either in the nature of a constitutional due process test, as in the United States or Canada, or any kind of forum non-convenience. Uh, to the extent that they think there are things that are exorbitant, they list them, uh, and uh, things like nationality of the plaintiff are uh, exorbitant, at least with regard to other domiciliaries of uh, uh, the EU. Um, the EU does reinforce its emphasis on the avoidance of forum shopping and limited fora by having a strict uh, in time rule. One of the, the EU recast offers um, an interesting perspective in thinking about transnational cases. Um, and this came up uh, because the EU, the recast will abolish some of these exorbitant bases of jurisdiction. So they won't be able to use Article 14 jurisdiction, nationality of the plaintiff, or presence of the property, which is the German basis um, in Article uh, 23. Um, so they will abolish all of those. And then they've added a few others, just special for the third party cases, um, which uh, deals with um, deals with a 
forum necessity grounds. So they also include or will include that if you can't sue anywhere else. And we talked about that as, again, something that the U.S. Um, does, not, um, does not permit. Um, so if you look generally, you would think that the EU has, and, and countries elsewhere, have broader rules of jurisdiction than we do. The one exception, of course, is the doing business uh, jurisdiction. Um, I think if uh, one thinks about uh, where the doing business jurisdiction may go, if you look at England, for example, um, it requires that you have a permanent establishment. And so I don't read, uh, I don't really read um, Justice Ginsburg's opinion quite as broadly as uh, Alan does about home. But I do think there might be a bricks and mortar uh, standard. Again, it would eliminate some of the indeterminacy of when you have enough uh, contacts. And um, the doing business jurisdiction was, as you've heard several times now, um, one of the uh, reasons that the Hague um, uh, Convention on the potential convention on jurisdiction judgments uh, fell apart. And um, I think the restriction of that doing business jurisdiction, I doubt that the maybe Justice Ginsburg, maybe Justice Kennedy are aware of what happens uh, abroad. There's certainly no discussion of that uh, by the uh, Supreme Court. There, of course, are practical limits facing a lawyer uh, who seeks to ground jurisdiction on doing business jurisdiction because you're not going to get that uh, action, in, that judgment enforced in uh, Europe. But if you have, if the defendant is a big defendant with assets in the United States, you won't uh, have to, um, you won't have that uh, problem. I think, as I said, uh, a nationwide, a, 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 I don't hear argue for national contacts with respect to doing business. Because if you think about it, at home must mean um, bricks and mortar, a particular state. And by expanding nationwide uh, contacts in this context, unlike specific jurisdiction, you are um, expanding a jurisdictional base that is already otherwise um, unpopular. So I think um, these transnational aspects uh, in Goodyear and Nicastro raise issues that are really different, in my view, from the classic interstate case. And I think they were deserving of more attention than they were given by the Supreme Court. And I hope that this uh, overview will uh, perhaps lead uh, us to think more critically about that, those aspects of the case. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Silberman. I have to say that um, your presentation reminded me of my second year as a law professor about a almost a decade ago when I was at a national conference and was talking to a fairly seasoned professor and mentioned that I teach both civil procedure and international law. And he commented that my international law class must draw a lot of students. It's sort of a fun class, not really real law, but fun for students. And I said, actually, I think of my international law class as a do not commit malpractice class, um, given the, the nature of international law and transnational law in today's um, practice on a daily basis. And I'm glad that we have a whole session to discuss this and appreciate uh, Professor Silberman's remarks. And what we'll do, and consistent with what we've been doing all day, is ask each of the panelists to speak for a couple of minutes with observations either about Professor Silverman's presentation or about the topic in general, and we'll lead with uh, Jonathan Blackman. Professor Silverman's uh, uh, talk was, was wonderful and covered you know, a huge uh, amount of uh, uh, information in, in a short space, and it's an area where I feel even less competent to talk than in other areas, so I'll respond to, uh, with just a few observations. One. Uh, Earlier today, I guess in the last panel, uh, Professor Miller talked about context and con things being contextual. And I think that is, is so much of what uh, 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 Professor Silverman was talking about. Uh, uh, the legal standard, such as it is, uh, is identical under the 14th Amendment and all these cases uh, uh, for uh, a non-U.S. defendant and a U.S. defendant. Uh, but there is no doubt that the court does take into account uh, the greater uh, burden uh, on the foreign defendant uh, and the facts 
all things being equal, uh, tend to mean that uh, uh, it will be harder to find uh, uh, the minimum contacts, however they're defined, uh, with a foreign entity, particularly uh, a non-major, if you will, foreign entity. Our, our McIntyre example, uh, uh, intuitively or commonsensically, uh, it does seem uh, more of a reach to say that this company in Nottingham uh, should be subjected to jurisdiction uh, in New Jersey based on uh, the fact that it had a relationship with an independent distributor in Ohio uh, as opposed to saying uh, that uh, a Pennsylvania manufacturer uh, should. All things being equal, clearly the, the foreigner uh, uh, is facing greater burdens and uh, uh, those burdens are, are not just the sort of localism issue. Uh, they're the burdens of dealing with a completely different legal system. I spend a lot of my time explaining to foreign clients that they have to, you know, come for a deposition, that they have to turn over documents not merely being defined as, quote, our official documents, but our handwritten scribbles. Those are also documents. You can be sanctioned if you don't turn them over. Uh, and they're things that American lawyers take for granted, but the rest of the world considers bizarre. Uh, and all of that does uh, uh, factor into the burden. In terms of you know, looking at a comparison between the EU regime and, and the US, at least in its current form, which just deals with, with member state uh, uh, jurisdiction, uh, there's a huge difference because that is in effect consensual. If you look at it from the standpoint that some of the speakers have talked about, about you know, political legitimacy and having, you know, being a part of the community uh, which is then exercising jurisdiction over you, uh, as a constitutional matter, the European states have all decided that this is going to be the regime that governs all of our citizens. So you know if you're a, a citizen of, of England that you're going to be sued in England it's your domicile, except in those cases where you won't be, i.e., if you go to commit a tort in France. And everyone, quote unquote, has agreed to that. But uh, the foreign defendant who's being sued in the United States uh, hasn't uh, had a vote. Uh, the, the only vote that was taken was uh, uh, in 1867, I guess, when the 14th Amendment was passed when no one had a clue that it would be <laughs> applied to any of the things we've been talking about. Uh, but uh, what it does mean there is that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the aspect of it that, that does focus on due process protection, how far should the state's reach go, really does properly remain uh, at the heart of our jurisprudence in a way that I don't think it is the case uh, in Europe where it's a sort of internal arrangement. Uh, the last point I wanted to make, uh, and here I'm really hesitant because I, although I live in London, I'm not an English lawyer, you probably would gather. Uh, there is a very interesting piece of the, the English uh, uh, jurisdictional test for so-called service out, and that service out is a reasonable prospect of success. The court, in giving leave to serve out, has to actually make a finding at the threshold uh, based on what is being presented to it before discovery, all the Iqbal Twombly stuff, uh, that there's a reasonable prospect of success. Now that, when you think about it, that's utterly foreign to our way of thinking. Uh, but it does sort of go directly to when we talk about the, the international shoe, uh, a fairness and substantial uh, justice aspect, uh, this is a test that has nothing to do with minimum contacts. This is a test of we're going to kind of decide at the outset that if this claim is really weak or frivolous, we're not going to subject the defendant to the burden of being taken in here to prove that in a full-blown sort of plenary case. And that's a, that's a kind of interesting take, which uh, I think Can is. I, it, I, just, I just want to say two things about that. First of all, you're absolutely right about the EU, and I used it as an example, but only because I thought it was very reflective of laws, national laws in other jurisdictions, so they have the same rules without yeah. your consent. Right. But you're absolutely right about the EU regulation. Secondly, 
that's not going to last very long because the EU recast is going to, those rules are now going to be in play against all defendants. That's right. And third, um, I, you know, I, the, the EU approach is the civil law approach, no discretion, and England is, of course, the one common law country uh, in there. I, two observations about that. One, of course, that rule is going to go uh, once we have the right. EU recast. Number two, as a practical matter, my sense of this, and I sat with an English law school years ago when I was doing my Fulbright uh, in England and, and have stayed sort of in touch. I don't think there's much uh, teeth, to, teeth that. to that anymore. Uh, I, you know, you may know better, but I, I, they, I would like to see the last case when they didn't have service out uh, in any of the cases that had the you know, any of the connection under whatever it is now, Rule 6.20, which I used to know as Order 11. Right. You're, you're right. My sense is that it is there. Uh, it is not uh, uh, terribly significant. But the point that it is there at all is a kind of interesting sort of, if nothing else, a footnote uh, to uh, uh, the, the discretionary, the non-mechanical, the non-bright line approach to jurisdictional issues. Well, well, let me just say that this also sort of brings out the value of comparative law, which is to think in ways that are totally dif different or foreign to our own approaches and think use them as vehicles at least to question why we approach things the way we do. Uh, Dean Carrington. Um, I have a little different perspective. Uh, I uh, represent, uh, I, it's an imaginary client, but uh, we've got a, a factory in North Carolina, and we're making a big tool that weighs about three tons, uh, and people who work with it are a little bit in danger. They might uh, lose a hand while working in this tool, uh, but uh, it's very valuable and very useful, and we'd like to sell it a lot of places, uh, but uh, we are a little concerned about tort liability and, and people losing their hand. but. Uh, we're prepared to assume responsibility for that and to bear tort liability if somebody cuts their hand because of some kind of misfeature, a mistaken feature of our machine. But do we have to compete with firms that don't have to pay that, that can avoid that by staying out of the, out of the United States and only sending their machine in in some uh, kind of offshore way, maybe uh, uh, the way in which uh, this same outfit uh, in uh, England seems to be doing it. I mean, can't we have some kind of competitive even-handedness with regard to our exposure to liability in New Jersey uh, with other uh, manufacturers who are making the same kind of tool? Uh, and you might also think about it from the point of view of a uh, New Jersey uh, health care program. If we get people who are could cut their hand off while working, that's going to be a considerable medical expense, and it's going to be borne by the state health care program. And we need some money to be able to pay for that, to hire the doctors and the hospitals and whatever. And where, where are we supposed to get that money? Could we have a kind of a tax on transactions that bring machines into, and if so, how, would we, how could we collect that tax? Is there some to make it a kind of an insurance scheme? Uh, uh, I offer those uh, to suggest that uh, th there are these uh, competing interests that uh, are at stake here, and it's not just a matter between this individual plaintiff and, and the uh, uh, manufacturer in England. Uh, we've got a lot of public interests that are also uh, connected, uh, and we don't have any alternative ways at re reasonably at hand for uh, solving those, those problems. Uh, and that's partly because we use this system as a system of risk regulation. This is how we deal with risks. And uh, if you allow uh, the foreign ent entrepreneur to come in and, and, and use our system without paying somewhere, somehow, for the uh, cost of the injuries that are going to be resulting, that has some economic consequences that affect not just the, uh, the plaintiff and the defendant, but have a lot of social consequences as well. And uh, so that's the, the, the kind of take I have on, on this, particularly on this case, it seems to me uh, 
uh, quite wrong headed to uh, not allow this plaintiff to uh, uh, proceed in New Jersey. Um, the uh, uh, other aspect of this is, if you, that strikes me is uh, the facts are that we do know do suggest to me an application of a principle that has a wonderful Latin name, and I learned it in Torx. Race ipsa loquitur. If you are selling a great big dangerous machine, uh, what uh, and it and you're getting twenty five thousand dollars for it, uh, doesn't that speak for itself with regard to the the defendant's knowledge and, and, and intent and relationship? Now maybe it could be disproved, but it seems to me the burden of proof ought to be in, a, in this kind of a case. The burden of proof ought to be located on the defendant to show, oh my God, how did this thing get there? We didn't know that was going to happen. We, we tried to prevent that from happening, and we didn't want to be exposed to the risk of having to pay hospital expenses in New Jersey for some guy who cut his hand off. Uh, and uh, if they could make a showing like that, then I might be more sympathetic to their condition. But it does seem to me that the evidence we do have uh, should have shifted the burden of inquiry, the burden of proof, uh, to uh, the defendant uh, to show us that, oh, my goodness, I have nothing to do with New Jersey. I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, I surely you don't blame me for that uh, under all these circumstances. So uh, those are, are two different ways of viewing the, the uh, situation in, uh, in McIntyre, and uh, I don't know that they add anything much to the discourse, but that's, uh, those are my thoughts at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Carrington. Professor Bromeyer. Well, if we don't uh, have to add anything to the discourse, I think I've got something that's more of a far out tangent than anything you said, oh, Dean well. uh, Carrington. <laughs> um, I had nothing to say about the, uh, the paper as written because I don't know anything about the subject, or I didn't when I started to read it, but I feel like I'm a mini expert now. It was a great paper, and I really Learned, learned a lot, um, but don't think I have any criticisms to, uh, to make of it. So I came up with a, a different little uh, problem that I've been chewing over for a couple of years, and I think it might uh, in some indirect way be relevant to the question of personal jurisdiction. And that's um, the, const the right of uh, foreign defendants to uh, invoke the U.S. Constitution which I think is a big unsolved problem, although right now if you read the personal jurisdiction cases, you wouldn't have any uh, clue that there was an issue there. I uh, became interested in this question um, about 20 years ago when I started to follow the way that uh, federal statutes were being applied extraterritorially. And it struck me that if a state uh, choice of law rule says to apply a state law that where uh, of the law of a state that has no connection with the dispute, we say, oh, there's a due process problem. And that's true whether it's a sister state law or the law of a, a foreign country. But if we have a federal law, such as uh, antitrust or a tax or a federal criminal law, it's treated as, as a much less serious, as a constitutional matter. It's hardly taken seriously at all. And I wrote an article about it at the time, and since then, um, I guess we could say that the federal constitutional protections for foreign um, uh, foreigners have gone south. The first case that we had was uh, Ver Verdugo Orquidez, which uh, effectively uh, blew the whistle on the Fourth and Fifth Amendment um, in the international criminal context. And then, of course, we had 9-11, uh, and with 9-11, all of the constitutional protections for uh, criminal defendants uh, doing anything related to uh, terrorism have uh, pretty much vanished. Now, I realize that it's not, um, it's not a very close analogy in some respects, the difference between judicial jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, which I think I, uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong about this. I don't think that it has ever been questioned in a Supreme Court case that, in, that civil defendants from foreign <coughs> countries have due process rights 
of some very substantial sort, maybe not identical, but, but pretty darn close. Um, but it's almost equally taken for granted that a defendant um, who gets picked up in Afghanistan for plotting some kind of criminal activity against uh, the United States is, has got, um, I think, effectively no, no constitutional rights at all. And it, that, I don't think that uh, law is going to change. So um, in lieu of commenting on your paper, which I don't feel I'm in a position to do, I thought I'd uh, drag out this problem of mine and see if uh, people had any thoughts. I have one thought, uh, <laughs> which is just limited to a context in which I do a lot of practice. One area where I think it may be the only one where uh, in the civil context, courts have been saying recently the foreign defendant doesn't have rights under the 14th Amendment is yeah. foreign states. Uh, under, <laughs> under the FSIA, yeah. Uh, the uh, D.C. Uh, Circuit has held, and, and other courts as well, have held that uh, uh, as long as the statutory personal jurisdiction standard is satisfied, right. simply means the existence of subject matter jurisdiction plus service, there is no separate personal jurisdiction issue, and they've specifically rejected earlier views in, in the original cases. Uh, the, the Judge Kaufman had a couple of decisions uh, uh, that said, that, well, there has to be a due process analysis also, and the uh, court, the D.C. Circuit and others have said, no, there doesn't. Why? Because the state, the foreign state, is not a, quote, person. But that's a sort of different... Yeah. And there's an interesting question about what you do. The cases that I know are foreign states, it's qua state. Not the, next the, agency, move, yes. the next move is to the instrumentality. Right. And then if you're now talking yeah. about, you know, the... The French National Railroad, or the right. you know the airline, the nationalized airlines, do they not have a right either? And then Lee's question about you know if, if none of those people have a due process right, why now does the private yeah. non-state no, defendant? It, it'll be very interesting to see how that part plays out because by definition the agency or instrumentality is presumed to be separate so, and treated other than for some you know, immunity purposes as identical to being exactly. a private commercial actor. Well, and there are nexuses between, in the case law, between terrorism and in instrumentality is the Lon Chile case. Yeah, <laughs> and the whole, everything starts to unravel uh, unless we do something to stop it. What would you suggest? I don't know. Somebody could come up with a nice bright line rule that said mm -hmm. constitutional rights over here, no constitutional rights over there. Or some, um, I mean, my own personal uh, preference about how to stop it would be that uh, a lot of people ought to have constitutional rights that apparently don't have constitutional rights now, for instance, in the terrorism context and, and maybe also in the state defendant context. Of course, the due process, constitu the, the constitutional due process right in the jurisdiction context seems to me to be one of the weaker constitutional <laughs> protections um, that we have. And, you know, the comparative story here is that almost nobody else, you know, thinks of jurisdiction that way. It doesn't say we're wrong. It merely says we're uh, different. And, of course, the other piece, Jonathan, is that the Supreme Court has not yet weighed in on this. I and, look forward and to that. And I look forward to that because it, 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 they may come back since, since personal jurisdiction has been this, you know, due process element forever and ever, they might not walk away from it in the, in the, even, in the in, even in the state, uh, foreign state context. Well, particularly because the courts that have, in fact, said that this foreign state, qua state, is not a person, have done it by analogy to states of the United States. Uh, um, and that is a completely mm -hmm. false analogy. Oh, exactly. <laughs> but it's the one that, in yeah, fact, the D.C. Right. Circuit and others okay. have relied on to say, well, since states of the United States are not, quote, persons, Obviously, a foreign state can't be a Well, I'm going to drop it here because it's going to show up on my list of important things that we have to do that starts at 4.30, and I don't want to lose lose my uh, chance to do that completely. No, and that's a good teaser for the 4.30 uh, closing <laughs> remarks, Professor Bromeyer. Let me ask uh, John Vale for his thoughts at the end of the conversation. Well, it's also actually a great segue into the first of the two points that I wanted to make because the my first point was why do we care? Why do we care about extending this constitutional right to foreigners? Uh, 
That question to me is not articulated in the cases. And I think if we spent some time thinking about that and articulating answers <coughs> to that questions, we might come up with some more clear reasons about what we think the law should be and why it should be that way. I think that question is under theorized and an important one to answer. I don't have an answer for it, uh, at least not here. You know, if somebody gives me a big grant and a time to go sit at a farmhouse in France and write for a while, I'll be happy to come up with it for you. <laughs> but uh, I, specifically with the, with the, in the context of Nicastro, you know, in, in the Castro, if there had been a federal cause of action in the Castro, I think there's no question that there would appropriately have been jurisdiction and venue exercised in New Jersey. Right? So from a fairness perspective, if that's our perspective, why is that different for the foreign defendant? Why, and going back to answer that question about why do we care, should we, should a foreign defendant gain an advantage from the idea that we are a federated nation state and have internal laws that are different regarding those things? I think that's a wholly re reasonable question to, to ask because, again, I go back to that question I raised before. I don't think that's a concern about fairness. I think it's a proxy of something else that's at work there. And again, engaging in that inquiry might tease those things out better. My second point was about uh, the plaintiff's interests. And another thing that's under-recognized, it's unstated in any of his jurisprudence, is that I'll go to, let me give my source which is Chief Justice Marshall in Marbury versus Madison, who writes that the first one of, when a person is injured, one of the first duties of any civilized state is to provide a remedy. The first duties of a state, it's not language that's familiar to us in constitutional discourse. We tend to think of constitutional rights as negatives on state power. But here we have Marshall articulating a principle of what a duty of the state is in fulfilling the social contract. That's a duty of the state. We see that same duty in the petition clause of the First Amendment. That's what the petition clause is about. It's about asking the government to provide a remedy for private harms as well as public harms. The court uh, last term in Bureau of Duria uh, reiterated that, uh, that proposition. It's not novel. The private civil dispute resolution system is the alternative to violence. It is of huge importance to the political functioning of our democracy. And it is a constitutional value to put on the scale against whatever value we decide to give to the idea of protecting foreign defendants from our jurisdiction. So those are, those are my two think about them some more points. Thank you. My panel is giving lots of think about them points, which is nice because <laughs> as, the end, as the end of the day approaches, things to walk away with uh, and think about. Uh, Dean Perdue. Um, okay, just a couple, couple of, of brief points. Um, first, to pick up on, on a point that both Linda made and, and Paul reiterated, I think in the international context, it, um, how it, the jurisdictional doctrine ought to cut goes in both directions. And it's actually one of the things that, that always concerned me about the language in Asahi, where they, there is this discussion about um, 
well, we want to be really careful because where we have foreigners involved and, and, we, and we have a federal interest in, in foreign affairs, and so we want to be really careful. And the way we'll be really careful is to constitutionally disable state courts. Mm, I'm not sure that's a way that one is the best way to be really careful um, because it, in some level, may take away a tool that, um, if I were a, a negotiator, maybe I'd want to have something to trade. If I were negotiating with a country on the other side that had, took a different view about jurisdiction, and I said, well, gee, can't we make a deal? And they'd say, if you've got nothing to swap, your constitution, your court has already disabled you. Um, so it wasn't, it's not entirely clear that that's a way we um, enable um, foreign affairs. Um, so I was glad not to see that language return, and, and I think it, it's part of this problem that, that the international situation goes in both directions. A second un unrelated point is just looking at the, the EU um, uh, approach to jurisdiction, which is, as I read it, if, if you kind of were to pretend that the, all of the interstate cases that we had got sort of dropped into Europe and we, we turned Oklahoma into France and New York into Germany, Audi made there. So we're you going just, a step beyond there. Don't yeah. you think? <laughs> but, but you sort of took all those cases and said how would they come out. I think pretty much all of them come out exactly the opposite. So um, us, I, I think Worldwide Volkswagen comes out differently. I think Coco comes out differently. I think Burger King comes out differently. I think, although I'm a little less clear on this, I think the place of performance is actually in Michigan, not in, in Florida. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, so that's a closer call. Um, I think Asahi comes out differently. I think Nicastro comes out differently. Oh. Helicopters comes out differently. Uh, yeah, so, so they, all right. Somehow they've got the, they've got the, they've also got the you know, additional defendant case right, also right. adds so, okay, um, all right, so we're different, but, but I got American exceptionalism, fine. Um, but it does give me pause then when I read all the language about sovereignty and about how the results in our case are the necessary result of states being sovereign. Because apparently the corollary, that would mean none of those places in Europe that think of themselves as sovereign nations actually are, um, because obviously if they were sovereign, they couldn't possibly be deciding any of the cases the way they're deciding them. Only you know, sovereign states must decide worldwide Volkswagen the way they do. Well, no. I mean, that's just silly. Um, so it, I mean, it highlights that, this, the, that the fact that you have sovereign states doesn't tell you anything about um, how those states, what, what the scope of sovereignty is. Um, so maybe maybe um, the court is right, maybe they're wrong about the scope of sovereignty, but you can't get there just by invoking sovereignty. Um, and, and that's one of the things you learn from the comparative law approach. All right, thank you, panel. Now we'll open it up uh, for questions from the floor. I agreed with most of what you said, and I thought your paper was wonderful. Thank you. <coughs> I'm not sure that uh, Chief Justice Roberts will rely upon it, but I thought it was terrific. Uh, Dean Carrington, um, it is necessary in the circumstance to determine if someone can be held liable, if there is recourse to justice from someone in the trail of liability. And if you're looking at the ultimate responsibility of someone in a product liability chain, uh, or hierarchy, then you have to look at indemnity. And in fact, I don't think, certainly not in this case, and not in general, and not in any circumstance cited by any of the five amici or the respondent's brief that Mr. Vale was on brief for, was a single instance of non-access to justice in the United States ever cited. It is, I think, important in the practical scheme of things to look at who has a right where 
and how indemnity works into it, where suit is brought, and what are the opportunities. So that would be my response to your comments. And it has to be specific, um, uh, particularly if there are failures in this scheme. On the issue of protections for foreign corporations, I would invite everyone to read the New Jersey Supreme Court opinion, the brief by the American Association for Justice, formerly known as the American Trial Lawyers Association, the amicus brief, and page 29 of the state amici brief, which was authored also, which was joined in by the state of South Carolina and my state, Maryland, among the 18 states. For excellent reasons why you want to protect foreign companies from what could be politely said to be hostility and parochialism of certain courts to foreign companies. The basic competence to regulate foreign trade is with the United States, and it is not up to New Jersey to decide to say that the scheme for importation, NAFTA, CAFTA, WTO, is neglectful of the interests of American people. We have TAA, we have all these protections. Whether they're sufficient or not, New Jersey has no competence, interest, uh, to decide, and they relied upon that in their decision. Um, this is an interference with basic federal functions. Um, uh, and if you want to know how 18, so the official position of 18 states and what we have to protect against, and this doctrine does a good idea, um, this was an analogy. Uh, drawing again on the comparison to criminal law, Petitioners, that's mine, which was adopted by six justices, position is as flawed as that of a criminal defendant who admits to having bombed a building with the intent to kill everyone inside and the hope of killing as many people as possible, but argues that he lacked the requisite intent to kill a particular person. That is what we are dealing with. I presented that language to, a, um, um, to lawyers outside the United States. And the question was, should we take that into account in deciding where to invest or deciding how to advise our clients? And I said, it's there, and you sh that should be part of the calculus. That's the official position of this state. And I know you all know about Joe Nocera. He had the decency to apologize for a less aggregated statement. Um, if you doubt the need for this protection, for foreign companies, if you doubt the need for the protection of the federal scheme of how we trade, which I may disagree with, you may disagree with, then I urge you to read those two amicus briefs and particularly the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court and some of the decisions that are cited in the, uh, in the appendix, including the one that says there's jurisdiction in, I think it was Arizona, because the United States is a gun-happy country. All right, thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Is there any uh, response from the panel or any other further questions? We have time for... Well, let me just uh, observe that, that, no. that states who want to, even if there were no constitutional protection, no federal constitutional protection, it would certainly be, states would certainly be permitted to um, do as they argued in their amici brief and protect anyone they want to. Any other questions? Mr. Stravitz, yeah. I have a comment. Uh, Mr. Ferguson suggested this was a federal concern and not of interest to the states. In Asahi, the weakest part of the opinion on the second branch was that although California has an interest in, a, in having foreign manufacturers' products comply with their tort law, that that same interest can be satisfied by having those who distribute directly in California subject to California tort law. So I think even in Asahi, uh, the court recognized, Justice O'Connor recognized, and eight justices recognized, there is an interest in each state where a product injures a citizen to have their tort regime apply to that state and their safety standards apply. That's all I have to say. The federal government has not. The federal Obama, government yeah. has not manifested much interest in regulating uh, risky business. Uh, they're, they're, if they were in the business of 
regulating these machines for safety, then there'd be a plausible argument in my mind for saying this is a federal issue and the states ought not be messing around with it. But the federal government's not doing anything to regulate the risk-taking by manufacturers of this device that they're shipping into New Jersey. And my point sort of is the rest of us have a stake in that, and you need to regulate it in one form or another. But they are. New Jersey regulates shipping. These machines, they have OSHA. There's federal OSHA. There's a lot of regulations. That's not the state of New Jersey protecting itself. Yes. The state of New Jersey has workplace regulations. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. But those are going to fall on the employer. But they can't be enforced. Huh? They can't be enforced against Jay McIntyre. No. Well, like, you know, so much else. I mean, we have to strike a balance. I don't think anyone would quarrel with the idea that a state regulates in a variety of ways. And one of the ways it regulates in our system is through tort laws. Okay? We accept that. But we also accept that there are limits on state regulation of different kinds. Some states have found limits in their own constitution to rein in what they view as sort of abusive activities. And so we've had, quote, tort reform. The federal constitution, as long as the due process clause remains the vehicle for dealing with exercises of state court jurisdiction, which it does, is there. And the question, which we can discuss as, you know, reasonable people, is where should those limits be? But it's really kind of reductionist to say, well, someone's injured and a state has the duty and right to protect its citizens, full stop. I mean, that's a plausible view. But it also is an extremely reductionist view that doesn't take into account a whole lot of other things that the 14th Amendment has been construed by everybody to take into account. In the particular case, how much account is given, how much weight, you know, that's what keeps us all employed, you know. And on the other hand, it doesn't, it's reductionist, I think, to say, well, you know, because we have people, you know, engaging in intemperate advocacy and briefs, that somehow is a particularly relevant factor to determining the scope of the 14th Amendment. It's not. I mean, I've seen enough comments in briefs, including even a few that I've written, to know that that's not really a source of either legal guidance or how one should make, you know, constitutional law. Okay. We're out of time for this panel. Please join me in thanking the panel. We'll go right into our final session.